If you saw my last video that I posted asking for footage, saying, oh, I'd really love to do tutorials for you, but I don't have any footage. Please send me footage. A number of you did, and, and I thank you for that. Uh, but one person in particular named Jeremy Thompson, who looks like a great filmmaker, uh, posted some footage that was particularly wonderful because it was challenging. And it looked like the typical footage that I would see on a big TV show or movie. So let's take a look at the footage. Here I am in DaVinci Resolve. Uh, I've switched all of my editorial to DaVinci Resolve. And I use editorial a lot because it's a big part of the QC process when we deliver shots. Uh, I used to do all of this in various other editing uh, packages, but I've settled on DaVinci Resolve because it's fantastic. If I had to cut another film, a short or something, I would do it in this. Anyway, let's look at Jeremy's footage. Here it is. And it's a little, a little jerky in Resolve. And why is it jerky if the Resolve is so great? Well, Jeremy sent me a sequence of TIFF images. Let's look at my media bin here and we can see the TIFFs are UHD. So let's look at the original footage because here, I'm gonna actually go to my email. Let's go to my email. Hi Jeremy, your footage is great for a tutorial. It looks like something a VFX artist would see on a big movie or TV show. I have some questions though. On what camera did you shoot this? Do you have a camera report? Mainly I'd be looking for lens, lens focal length, camera body. Do you have a log color version of this footage? That's important because when I looked at what he sent me, those tips, they were color corrected. I could tell this was not the raw data from the camera. And if you looked at any of my old tutorials, you would know I want the closest thing to the camera original that I can get. I want the film negative. I want like the original. So I asked him, do you have, any, do you have a log color version of this footage? None of these would be necessary for a tutorial, but they would be helpful. If you have none of them, I'd have to mention that those are things you should get anytime you're shooting anything. Thanks for sending this along and let me know what you think. So what does Jeremy say? I can provide you with everything you've asked. This is wonderful. Um, on what camera did you shoot this? He shot this on a Blackmagic Cinema Pocket Camera 6K. The shot is rack focused. That's important because when you see shots that are rack focused, you really should be solving those as zoom cameras, as zooming lenses. And that's a whole other tutorial that I'm working on right now on why all prime lenses are actually zoom lenses. Anyway, do you have a log color version of this footage? The one I delivered to you is just a very basic color pass for tracking. So let's talk about that sentence there. I never, and you, if you're tracking, you should never want anybody to pre-color correct the original footage. Why? Go back to my old videos where I talk about, you, you know, pulling more detail out of the dark areas of the image through image pre-processing and finding more details in the lighter areas of the image. You don't have that latitude to move around so much if you don't have the raw footage. You need the original footage. That's why. The one I delivered to you is just a very basic color pass for tracking. I understand that Synthai's latest version now has the ability to read and work with B-RAW, which it does. If you wanted to use this in the tutorial, I am happy to supply the RAW file to you. He did send me the whole, he, he shot this, he shot this series of takes in a series. So it basically means you call action, you start recording and you never call cut as the director. You just go back to one and you do multiple passes. So that's called shooting takes in a series. For this shot, it totally makes sense. I mean, I, would, I wouldn't want to do that necessarily with actors, but for this shot, it makes sense. So let's look at that footage. Oh, look at this. It's playing fine. It's perfect. Uh, no drop frames, no skipping, no nothing like that. And this footage, if you look back over on this window, you'll see that this is 6K, 6144 by 3456. 
and it's just playing. So those TIFF images will slow you down in editorial if they're not transcoded to some editorial friendly file format like ProRes or... I really hope you never have to work with Avid DNX, but anyway. Um, getting back to this, so we have our footage, but I, I had some back and forth dialogue with Jeremy and he provided me with some time code, but the time code he provided me was timeline time code. So he cut his footage and he dropped it onto a fresh timeline and he gave me those numbers. Now, that's typically not terribly helpful. What you want to do is, let's just drop this into our timeline here. Do, do, do. There we go. So here's our footage. And uh, I'm, I'm a little zoomed in here, so let's zoom back out. Let's go back to the beginning of our timeline. We'll hit the space bar and we'll hit play. So that's cool. Now, Jeremy gave me his time code and then I converted it and I figured out where it was. But I'm gonna show you, I think, a better way to do it. Uh, for this example, I wouldn't do this every time, but for this example, it's probably good. So I'm gonna drop this right on the timeline. This is the original uh, footage they sent me, the TIFF images. And let's look at this. Let's go to the last frame of that. Um, and we're gonna back up. We're gonna go back, 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 back to find a frame that's very easily identifiable. So this frame is perfect. Um, if we zoom in here, and we look, we can see that that uh, turn signal, probably a turn signal, looks like a turn signal. Um, that light comes on on that frame and it turns off on that frame, so that's perfect. So we know that's right where that happens. And I can set a marker in that uh, clip for that. And the marker will move around with the clip now, so that's nice. Let's zoom back out to fit. Let's find where that bus comes in because we know that the bus only comes in on one of the uh, takes in the series. So I happen to know that. So there, that, that light comes on right there. So I'm going to make a marker right there. And with snapping turned on, turn on snapping and then you can just line those things up. Now I'm gonna grab the blade tool and I'm just gonna cut the footage. So cool, and then select this and delete and select that and delete. And then now when we look at the footage, I'm gonna make this fit again. And I'm going to turn off video two. Oh, so now I just discovered something else. It looks like in the TIFFs, Jeremy has pushed in and, and blown up the image a bit. He's repositioned and he's moved it around. You never, ever, ever, this is why you want that raw footage. VFX supervisors, compositing supervisors, this is important. When you're compositing and you've got repos and push-ins and things like that, especially if they're animated, you should be tracking the original footage. You should be compositing with the original footage and then all of those repositions and moves and all of that, that should be done as the last step to integrate in, in it'll make the comp better. Your motion blur will make, it'll be better. Everything will match. So I can talk for, for hours about that. Just composite at the original camera resolution with no pushes and no repositions. Just trust me on that. But we know that this is the frame range for this footage. If I double click, it will bring that footage up into this window and it'll show me my in and out point. It'll even show me my marker. So that's awesome. Now, I want to, when you look at the size of the file, of that B-RAW file, this file is five gigabytes. Not actually that big. We're gonna trim it though, so that 
when we del like if you were in charge of the editorial process, if you were in VFX editorial and you needed to trim your footage, I'm gonna show you how to do that in Resolve. So let's take our footage with our in and out points and we're gonna go file, media management. And we're gonna say clips. And we're gonna select this clip. Zero clips selected, so we're gonna use selected timeline clips. And it says two clips selected. I've only selected one, but there are two because it's selecting the video and the audio, which is fine. So copy only used media files. We're gonna use the selected timeline clips. And we're gonna say, where, where do we want these? We're gonna put it in tutorials, whip pan, clip one, media, and I'm gonna hit go. Oh, and you can also set handles here. I should have mentioned that before. So I could say, give me 10 frame handles. That would be cool. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna stick with what Jeremy's timeline is exactly uh, based on eye matching it to the original footage. And I'm gonna say start. All right, let's look if that actually worked. Holy cow, it did. Uh, I'm gonna rename it underscore trim two. And why trim two? Because like I said, I already trimmed it once. Um, I sent that back to uh, Jeremy and he said, oh, that your trim is great. So, and it, and it was a little, like I put my, some handles on there. And I put more handles on because of the tracking. So let's talk a little bit about the tracking. I, I'm only gonna cover this aspect, the um, how to trim the footage in Resolve in this tutorial. We're gonna get to the tracking in the next tutorial, but when you get footage, one of the first things you're gonna do is you're gonna look at it from the point of view of establishing a a plan. You're gonna to have to come up with a plan of attack. And so when we look at this, you know, sometimes when you see this, you're like, all right, well, what are the problems with this in terms of tracking? Well, this seems fine. I mean, there's plenty in the beginning. This, this is not hard. You can track that just fine. You get plenty of parallax. You get like that little uh, pillar of concrete on the screen right. And then when you pull back, even the, the small amount of parallax in between the wall and these pipes, that's enough for Synthize to pull off the track. But the problem is, right? This whip pan, you get no parallax. What's happening? I, we don't know. Um, Jeremy also said in his notes that there was a rack focus. So if he's racking focus from extreme foreground to the background, well, that's gonna be also a focal length change and a field of view change. So it's, you're throwing so many different problems at Synthize in terms of calculation that you're gonna be in deep trouble. So I trimmed it um, with much bigger handles to see, let's go back to the B-Raw, to see if there was maybe more parallax, like maybe in one, you know, before the take started and after the, the take cuts, maybe there was like a little bit more camera motion from left to right at the end that we could pull out more parallax, but there really wasn't, so. That's why I've retrimmed it. There we go. That, that kind of covers everything I wanted to cover in here. In the next tutorial, I'm going to discuss, first of all, the plan of attack for this kind of shot. And we're gonna go into how to execute the track. Uh, it's super challenging. And it is not a shot that you can auto track. It's not a shot that even with supervised tracking, you're gonna get great results without jumping through a lot of hoops. And I'll show you what those hoops are. So stay tuned and I will see you in the next tutorial.